everyone, and welcome back. I'm Allison. I'm Amanda. I'm Christopher. And I'm Matt. And this is What Scares Us, a podcast where four friends share the movies that freak us out. Brought to you by the Ann Arbor District Library. Today we'll be talking about the 2007 film The Orphanage, directed by J.A. Bayona. The Orphanage is a Spanish Gothic supernatural horror where we'll ponder, what does it mean to be lost? A couple fun facts to get us started. The Orphanage is the debut film of not just the director, J.A. Bayona, but also the screenwriter, the editor, the composer, and the cinematographer's first films as well. And there is a reason for that, which we'll get into later. It was the second highest grossing debut ever for a Spanish film and was the biggest opening of the year, making it 168% larger than the worldwide success of Pan's Labyrinth the previous year. It won seven Goya. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> <laughs> it won seven Goya Awards, which are often referred to as the Academy Awards of Spain, including for Best New Director, Best Original Screenplay, Best Sound, and Best Makeup and Hairstyles. It was nominated for a total of fourteen Goya Awards that year. It made Rolling Stone's list of 20 scariest horror movies you've never heard of and was number 39 on Harper's Bazaar list of 55 scariest horror movies of all time. And I have a few more facts that I want to dig into, but I'd actually like to save it for the end after we've talked about the movie in full. So what'd you think? I liked it. I thought it was beautiful. Even though Guillermo del Toro was the producer and not the director, I thought there were a lot of influences there, and I really like him. So, uh, and I love a good ghost story. I also really liked it. The thing that I kept running into when I was watching the movie was every time I would start to feel like it was dragging, then something really cool would happen. So it kept me pretty well engaged the entire time, and I also, I was very surprised by the ending or near the ending. Like, like the the um, the reveals all worked on me. Although, I will say, hugely catastrophic bummer of a story. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I watched it on a beautiful 77-degree day in Michigan with all of my windows open, sitting next to my dog, to then be treated to this story. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it's a real romp. A real wrong. <clears throat> um, I I was not super into this movie. It was just the mother running around. Um, I I understood her pain, but I was just like, eh, this woman's just running around. I'm just not into. I wasn't into it. I wanted more like s- spooky. I wanted these creep. I wanted some creepy kid action. Um, but a lot of redemption happened in my mind for this movie and my experience with it. The last twenty minutes when some of the reveals started to happen. And you're putting together the pieces, and I loved all the Peter Pan stuff. And for me, that really further redeemed a lot of pieces was figuring out the Lost Children thing. And then, so for me, a lot of pieces came together. And I, I, it's still not like I don't love the movie. I think it's well done. Um, Don't want to watch it again. But I I am excited to talk about some of the pieces of the movie and kind of how the, the games and how the some of the themes in the movie came together. And so agreed, (laughs) agreed. I'm not surprised you didn't like it because when I had talked, I had floated the idea of doing The Devil's Backbone, which is by Del Toro, and it's pretty similar to this movie. And I mentioned Pan's Labyrinth, and you were like, nope, 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 I will not like that. Oh. (laughs) Well, yeah. Get into that. Why? Yeah. (laughs) So not a fan. (laughs) Well, well, when Allison was doing um, the little intro to set us up and she mentioned Pan's Labyrinth, I gave a big thumbs down (laughs) just to quietly just like... Of course, people in the room acknowledge that, and I was just like, mm. it's just a lot of fancy show, and not a lot's going on. Like, yeah. if, if Crimson Peak, it's beautiful. It's gothic. It's like, maybe this is just the theme, and not everybody has to, like, I love cinema. I love a good movie. I'm into cinematography and how gorgeous things are and how wonderful the sound is, and there could be movies that hit all of the right things, but if I'm not in the story or in the characters or into, like, whatever deep theme I'm supposed to be understanding, like, it's okay. I can yeah. appreciate the cinema that's going on without having to be like, nope, don't really want to watch that or recommend it. But other people can watch some of, not just his things or a movie, but you can still watch the movie and people can love it. They, they get into that and that is their vibe and that's their thing. You know, that's why people have different tastes and things. But for me, yeah. And I did not wait to the last minute to watch it. 
Um, nice. So yeah, and again, part of it is just, again, like the same thing with being involved in so many book discussions at the library. I'm reading things outside my norm that I wouldn't have grabbed. Then I read it and I'm like, oh, I really love this. Oh my goodness. And so that's sort of like what's happening with this little podcast is I'm watching things that I would not have. And I think for this movie, I feel like it was on one of my, I think I saved it on my list on one of my streaming things. I think I was looking up, I think I wanted to watch more um, movies with like haunted houses in them. And this was, I think this was on one of the list. And Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean I ever would have probably gone to it. I'm really bad about, if it's on my list or it's actually on my list on my streaming thing as a save to be watched later. Oh, I never go. If I want to sit and scroll to watch something, I'll scroll for a half hour and sitting, I said, I'm going to my list. That list is where stuff goes to die. Yeah. (laughs) And so I think sadly this movie was on there for no particular reason. It was just like, oh, okay, I'll put that on the list and... Well, you and Christopher can duke it out over uh, Crimson Peak later. <laughs> Love Crimson <laughs> Peak. <laughs> Congratulations. I even put in my notes for this movie, a lot like Crimson Peak in yeah. spots. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to get into it? Yeah. All right. So we open on a young Laura. I'm going to be screwing up these names the whole time. Laura Simone. I'm going to say them wrong every time. It's Okay. I don't remember anybody's names. <laughs> the boy, the girl. The other boy, the, the scary the boy, the scarier boy. <laughs> All right. We open on a young Laura playing a game with her friends at the orphanage where they live. We overhear a phone call that Laura was adopted and will be leaving that day. Then we see a title card with children's hands ripping away wallpaper. We flash forward to an adult Laura con- comforting her son, Simone, in the night. Her husband, Carlos, says he'll go, but he does not. The next day, Carlos and Laura play the piano together and chat with Simone as movers prepare the house. Laura and Simone visit the nearby caves where Simone meets another of his imaginary friends, Tomas. Simone invites him to play at the house and leaves a trail of seashells for Tomas to follow home. First of all, I loved the opening with the children's game. Mm -hmm. It reminded me so much of Red Light, Green Light. Yeah. And I had no idea that that was going to come back, but still, I just thought it was really a cool setup. And after we've seen so many horror movies, you know, this was something I hadn't quite seen before, this this exact thing. Mm-hmm. And anyway, I thought it was a great opening. Yeah, it was really beautiful. I loved seeing the building in full form, and I loved seeing the kids in their little uniforms just, like, frolicking and giggling and laughing and playing. And then it turns out those are little feathers floating through. I thought it was just very atmospheric and beautiful. And I was like, oh, okay, it's beautiful. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, so I was excited to see what was going to happen to the kids. Yeah, it, it drew me in right away. And actually, I had the opposite experience when I, when they were playing that game. I had a note immediately that was like, they're definitely going to do this again. Because like, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it felt so, like, intentionally there. Just like, look at this fucking game there. Right. They're going to do it again, and it's going to be used in a scary way later. Yeah. See, um, I'm, I'm too naive. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I wish I was more naive. Um yeah, I I had a couple of little notes like towards the beginning. High ceilings, beautiful house. Um, <laughs> v- especially after when they are moving in, um, and you're getting a look at some of the woodwork and the stairs and stuff. As somebody that spends a lot of time on Zillow, we'll talk about that house later. There's mm-hmm. a couple pretty interesting things because it's a real. They built a bunch of the interior stuff on a soundstage, yeah. but it's mm-hmm. a real house in Spain. Nice. Uh, 2007 special effects are very funny. Uh, this, and this was also, this movie was made, I think, like right in the middle of the let's put lens flare on absolutely everything. Yes. And it was <laughs> really distracting to me. But I also understand that I think this was around when that first Star Trek movie came out, right? Wasn't it around that point? Or it was within a couple of years of that. And that was maybe the most egregious. Wasn't that like in the late 90s? The no, Star no. Trek movie, the J.J. Abrams. Oh, sorry, I'm thinking Star Wars. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the J.J. Abrams one. I think it was like 2009 or something. But this was when lens flare was being added all over the place, and it's added pretty hilariously, and I think pretty poorly in this movie. But I'm sure that part of that was pretty low budget that they were working with, as yeah. far as I can tell. They yeah. did so. a lot of digital effects. It sounds like there's yeah. a lot of post production. They did some practical, like with the snow and stuff, but yeah. a lot of digital. And you could see it. 
it didn't detract from the actual story or the movie, but I definitely was distracted by some of the some of the two thousand seven ness mm-hmm. of the effects. Yeah, <laughs> I think it did have a pretty low budget. I think yeah. they had an even lower budget until Del Toro got involved because one sure. of his big contributions was getting them like an appropriate amount of money to tell the story. Good. And probably help with the marketing, too, because yes. they could say, hey, remember Pan's Labyrinth <laughs> when, when this movie came out? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, I also uh, would love a side movie about Watson and Pepe, the imaginary <laughs> friends. <Yes. Yeah. laughs> well, apparently those are, did you guys watch the bonus footage? Yeah. So. There were a couple of short things, and one of the things it was the director, those were like two, or was the writer, the writer, he is... Two of his imaginary friends as a kid were those two. Oh, two. really? Watson and Pepe. Mm-hmm. I would never do that as a writer. Like, put my own, like, you're just asking for them to come to life or, yes. like, have some, like, dark half thing happen to you. Also, Simone <clears throat> is based on the writer as a kid. He said that Simone, the writer said that Simone was based on him and and the two imaginary friends. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I must have missed that. Simone was is in the, the cutest little boy in the world. He is, with his little curly hair and his giant eyes. It was in the extra, there was a bonus footage called When Laura Grew Up, and it's only 17 minutes long, and it has a couple little snippets. I love the piano playing scene with the two parents. Um, I think it's really sweet, but it also introduces the idea that there were, like, loud bumps and, like, banging noises in the house, which comes, it happens a few times, which sort of, like, Ends up being very important. Yes. Ends up being super important. (laughs) Devastatingly important. (laughs) I also really question Laura's, like, parenting skills in general when she just lets Simone run into this fucking cave. No shit. That was the first thing I thought. Like, that's a big spooky cave. Why would you let a kid run that far ahead? You don't know how, how, like... There's no way that she had been in there yet. Well, actually, no, that's not true because she would have gone when she was a kid, right? When she was right? a kid, yeah. But, but still, still. 30 years later, <laughs> there might be some changes. Yeah. <laughs> Things have probably changed in the cave. And they had. Yes. <laughs> she waits outside, too. She lets him play mm-hmm. in there for a long time. Yeah, I just have a lot of issues with the mom throughout the movie for some reason. But I think that whole setup, you've got this old, amazing house. You've got a cave. You've got a lighthouse. To me, this already feels like Crimson Peak. <laughs> it's also a bingo card for like a ghost story. Just like yeah. Every yeah. possible thing that you could have is in this. Plus imaginary friends. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was funny because while I was, I watched this before to make sure it wasn't like a crappy movie. But um, I was like, Lighthouse, hmm, okay. The little boy who wants the gold, he has gold coins, coins that yeah. are, it's like, oh my gosh, this is like the fog redux. <laughs> this is Stevie Wayne. Look <laughs> <laughs> out for the fog. Um, well, it has a bunch of those like horror tropes. It has a lot of them in it. Yeah. Um, as far as a like, ghost story, spooky orphanage, there's kid games, there's a frantic mother. Um, you've got a medium to come in and do a semi-seance and trying to rid the house of whatever there's. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of pieces going on. In the next scene, an old woman comes to the door, Benina Escobedo. She claims that she's a social worker here for Simone. It's revealed to the audience that Simone doesn't know that he's adopted and he doesn't know that he is HIV positive. Later that night, Laura hears loud noises in the house. She tries to wake Carlos, but he goes back to bed. (laughs) Laura follows the noise outside where she finds Benina in their shed. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> big laugh at the reveal of, of her with the yeah. shovel I that immediately made me laugh yeah, oh, yeah. I, I just yeah I love that scene oh, it yeah. just flashes <laughs> over I think you just see her eyes don't you yeah she's and standing the there the trying glasses right yeah. oh yeah. my god yeah. <laughs> and then she scurries out oh, no that's god. a good that's I like that scene a lot yeah. <laughs> that was a good moment of horror <laughs> yeah it's really funny watching her like run away because it's so slow and yeah. like yeah just Benina's little butt scurrying away <laughs> it's like oh whoops I don't understand why the mom didn't take a flashlight out with her I that know. was that was my my nitpicky note that I had because like, one thing I thought of is the woman I don't the woman is not the mom is not afraid of the house she's not afraid of her kid walking into the cave so I think she has some attachment and like mm-hmm. just like love for where she's not expecting spooky things, and we're all like, uh, what's going on? And she's just, she grew up there. Right. She is trying to reopen the orphanage for more kids to come. Like, they are readying the place to have more kids come, and she wants to give them what she had when she was a kid. Um, and what was she, like, maybe seven when she left it? Yeah. Or eight? For me, that was sort of, like, her, not lack of fear, not lack of worry, because all of that comes into play, but as far as, like, allowing that sort of, like, 
oh, that's why she's not she's not afraid. Like this is where she grew up and this is where she wants to bring more kids. Right. So if she thought it was spooky in any way, she's not going to want to bring a bunch of like, you know, kids to come and live in this home. So that was my part of my my excuse for her not doing those things. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's even a line where Simona's like, weren't you scared living here? And she's like, no, like there were so many of us you'd have to. Mm. Oh, Simone asks her. Yeah. And she said, no, we were, um, there was a group of us. Yeah. Like safety in numbers. This is another instance where there's like a loud banging noise that's happening in the house. Mm -hmm. This is already the second time that's happened. Um, I love that Carlos is asleep for all of this. Carlos is not waking up for anything. Classic guy stuff. (laughs) Doesn't believe, doesn't support. No. Yep. And that was one thing, because after watching the movie, one thing that I went back and got out of the piano scene was the mom and dad, like, being a couple or being together or having their little shared, they both played the piano. So mm-hmm. having that shared experience of why, maybe why they were together, because there's, like, stuff that happens later on, like, the dad leaves, and I'm like, what, what, what is going on? Why is this, the mother's running around on her own trying to solve all these mysteries and figure everything out and find their lost kid, and the dad's just like, hmm, you're, this is a lot, and bye. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I did appreciate the piano scene, having those two together. It's like the only time that we see them happy together, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. And even that, it, there's like a weird darkness to the way that they look at each other. We need a spinoff. We need a, we need a Carlos movie. Carlos <laughs> and his two kids, Watson and Pepe. <laughs> <laughs> I also love how Carlos is like, oh, if she comes back, we'll call the cops. How about you call the cops now? Yeah. This lady's not supposed to be in your shed. <laughs> right. <laughs> The next morning, Simone pesters Laura to let him wake up. Laura finds a pile of seashells outside the front door. Inside, Laura and Simone talk about Peter Pan and Wendy and about when they will die. Laura asks Simone about the picture he drew of his new friends, and Simone explains the rules of the treasure game that they play. Essentially, if you follow the clues and find the treasure, you get a wish. Uh, Simone shows Laura his treasures, which starts the treasure hunt around the house. They find Simone's coins in the same drawer his medical records from Benina were locked in, and Simone reveals that Tomas told him that Laura is not his biological mother and that he is going to die. Laura and Carlos sit Simone down for a conversation. So I loved the whole treasure hunt scene. Yeah. That was exciting, and you didn't know where it was going, or at least Mm -hmm. I didn't know where it was going, but it's also kind of creepy, too. It's like, wait a minute. What is happening? Yeah. You know, there's like a kind of sort of whimsical music that's happening. That was the first instance where the movie had started to lose me a little bit. And then the second that they did that, I was right back into Mm -hmm. it. You know, otherwise, I don't know if I would have continued watching if that hadn't have happened. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the writer said in some of the commentary was that this is Peter Pan from the mother's point of view. Hmm. So and so that was the first scene, and I was like, I'm like, oh cool, they're reading Peter Pan, and I like the story of like you know like the lost boys, the lost children, they never grow up, and I didn't really think that that would be like the crux of the movie or anything, and it ends up being a huge part of it, and that was a huge part of the redeeming factor for me was the mm-hmm. the idea of all the little things that come into play, um, so I did like that scene, mm-hmm. and you could see that the mother was concerned about like, wait, where did you get that, and why are you here, and like then how they ended up finding the file, no, and he him knowing then that he was adopted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I couldn't tell when Simone asks her, someone asks the mother, how old are you? Mm -hmm. Right. And she says. Simone in that scene. Yeah. Right. And she says, I'm 37. Yep. I couldn't. Now that you say that, that this is from the mother's point of view, a retelling of Peter Pan. I couldn't. Now looking back, I'm not sure if she was sad that she was 37 or not. Was she wistful? Answering that, does she wish she was going to be forever young? Or anyway, huh, not yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, I too, it's an interesting that, point. That's a good scene, though, because it's concerning to her that he says he's not going to grow up. Yeah, you know, right. Like he's like basically saying, hey, I'm going to die young, too, and go live with my friends that are also dead. <laughs> yeah. Brutal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he, then he, then he starts, and once you figure out you know, what's happening at the end, like this scene, I, I went back and watched the scene again after I watched the end, because their conversation exactly happens at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, like, well, you, will, you come, will you come with us? Will you watch over us? Like that kind of thing, and that ends up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even the very beginning when he's like, uh, Mama, can I wake up? That's mm-hmm. the very yep, that first com- thing he says to her at the end yep, when he does back. wake up. Yeah. Um, I also really like, um, there's like a, a shot where Laura is watching Simone draw that picture of his friends. And it's like half of her face is behind the door and in shadow and the other half is just watching him. That same shot comes up again 
midway through the movie, she's watching Carlos play the same note on the piano. And it's the exact same shot of just half of her face. One other thing that happened. So in that scene when they're sitting together and he's reading Peter Pan and closes his book and then starts asking her questions about when are you going to die, that kind of thing. Um, she calls him darling mm-hmm. in that scene. And I don't know if she did earlier, but since he was reading Peter Pan and oh. was called darling, darling is the family name in Peter Pan. Like that's the kid's last name, Ugh. like Wendy oh. Darling and more they're darling. So every other time she called him darling. Huh. So I just felt like they had to have been intentional in some way. That's you know? really and cool. It's just like, I never it, thought about that. It's just that. a term of endearment, but I was just like, eh. Just yeah. a little. Huh. That's yeah. cool. It's like blowing my mind And if he wasn't, bit. and if he were... Um, this is a 100% random thing that has nothing to do with the movie at all. But um, so, when they sit Simone down, he asked if Santa Claus is real. There's also a Santa Claus behind Benina. Uh, when I saw that, that. Yeah. And then at the end, she also asks, at the very end, when the camera's swirling around the two of them downstairs, um, she says she tells him to think about next Christmas. I just think that's yeah. like a weird like recurring motif or something like it has nothing to do with the story at all but santa yeah. claus is all over the place kids okay. love christmas <laughs> it had to have been important yeah because if you're looking at it from a kid's point of view and he's away for lying about me you know being adopted and being sick are you lying about santa claus too like how mm-hmm. truthful are you as an it's adult the first to thing he came to and if so. you're a kid um like santa's a huge part of like re- fantasy versus reality mm-hmm. and so and that's like you know being a kid and what do you like when you're a kid you, if you like are you're one of the lost boys. Like, what do you believe in? You believe in fantasy and magic and, you know, things like that. And then when you're an adult. So that's kind of cool. Well, I didn't realize Santa was in it so much. But that's an interesting point, too, because that's sort of Simone's whole deal is like trying to differentiate fantasy from what is real and mm-hmm. are his friends real and that sort of thing. But huh. if you remember, the parents never answer the question. I know. <laughs> I, and I was waiting. It's like, oh, my God, what are they yeah. going to say? Yeah. <laughs> and they just told the dad totally dodged it. I don't know his exact response, but it was not yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> In that same conversation, they set up that it would take many weeks for Simone to die without his HIV medication. Right. Um, which is useful information for, like, midway through the movie. Although... <laughs> I guess I should have done a spoiler alert before we got into it. but Oh, there's um, spoilers. Whatever. Yeah, I'm assuming you've seen this movie if you're listening to this. But um, <laughs> fucking Carlos says, uh, don't worry, we'll take care of you. You won't get sick and die. Simone dies the next day. You idiot. <laughs> like, yeah. Total failure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to bring up in this uh, section of the movie is... Um, when Laura yells at Simone after he finds the coins and the medical records, he pushes her a couple times. Because um, the next few scenes, there's like some ambiguity as to who um, Laura is like interacting with when there's the kid with the sack mask. And I think this is a little clue as to who that person's identity could be because he pushes her a couple times. Mm. Uh, the next day is the open house. Simone says he wants to show Laura Tomas's little house, but she says no. They argue over it, and Laura slaps Simone. Big uh, time. Yeah. No fun. Oh, his little face just mm-hmm. crumples. Yep. Ugh. Laura thinks she sees Benina at the party, but it's someone else, and the audience sees a child dressed in old clothes and a sack mask. Laura goes to find Simone and is pushed into the bathroom by the child in the sack mask. The door crushes her hand, and the child locks her inside. Carlos lets her out, and they search for Simone all across the property. She runs to the cave, thinking he might have gone there, but the tide comes in before she can find him. She accidentally breaks her leg, but sees the the figure of a child in the cave as Carlos pulls her away. The Better Business Bureau might have something to say about her uh, <laughs> her plans to open a new home yeah. for children. <laughs> well, after her kid goes missing, that's what she asks that question. She goes, they're never going to let me open the orphanage now. <laughs> Nor should um, they. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But it, for me, okay, so for the open house, it's a giant party. There's a ton of, like, prospective kids that are going to be living there. I don't understand. Why was everybody wearing masks? Is that, like, a cultural thing? Or is it just part of, like, they were all wearing, like, little animal masks? Yeah. And I was like, what is this, Pet cemetery? Like, <laughs> right. Or or the Shining. And I didn't, I didn't, look, I didn't, yeah. and I yeah. didn't look it up or anything. I was just curious because uh, the adults and kids were wearing these, like, more bizarre-looking, like, yes. animal-type masks. So a lot of people are wearing masks. And then you have this um, young boy wearing, like, the sock mask. And so later on, when the mother is trying to find Simone, she's running around her yard, ripping the masks off of every adult and kid she sees. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, you can see that kid is, you know, wearing a dress and red hair. It's not, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So I didn't know. And then later on, like with the pig mask, like a couple days later or after Thomas is, or the boy Simone is missing, like there's a pig mask like on the table outside the bathroom still. Yeah. Well, she puts it there when she's looking for him before she but goes it stays into there the for a while. Yeah. Mm. So the masks are just like because they needed that for her to be searching for him or something. I don't know. Honestly, I think this is like one of the dumbest parts of this movie. I don't understand. I'm like, why is everybody <laughs> wearing it? Like this is like a party for perspective. Like you know, yeah. handicapped orphans do come live in her home. Also, how do you arrange something like that? And I didn't know if it was like a cultural, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. If that was, because they were like painted, like cool, like um, animal type masks. And so I didn't know if that was just like, or if it was supposed to be fun for kids. Like, hey, come hang out at our orphanage because it's fun. We play mask games. Right. Was it taking knock, place knock. around, like, what time of year was it taking place? I don't know. I don't like, know if it was a yeah. festival thing or. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, you know, sometimes I have parties and they're Spanish orphanage themed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah. We all wear yeah. right. paper mache That's animal right. masks. Well, we all know like that a, about you. Yes. Like, yeah, maybe it was like a, a festival that time of year in Spain or something that coincided. And then you slam know. somebody's hands in the, <laughs> in the door. And, and then whatever. we eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that scene though when he shoves her. Did you already mention the part where he shoves her and like her finger gets totally Ooh. smushed? I'm like, oh, wasn't a degloving? Yeah, it was just like a defingering. Right. She's wearing a very light colored dress. There's not a drop of blood on her dress. And later she's on, very lucky. And later on, yeah. she's not even the finger's not even bandaged from what I could tell. And she's running around, and I'm like, why is the you just defingered half your finger? Just a the finger the fingertip's oh. gone. And it's like, where, why are you not? Like, she picks off her fingernail. Yeah. And there's She's no blood yeah. dripping. Yes. And I'm like, yeah. it's a horror movie, that but definitely... there's no there's no blood and gore in here. That's another thing. So yeah. that would have been too much if you had a mom running around with, like, blood on her dress. But she doesn't even swear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like if somebody slammed my yeah. fingers in the door, <laughs> there might be. But he, then... she did just slap him. Right. Yeah. You know, this is... Everything that happened from the slap until the hand being slammed in was weird and chaotic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then ripping the fingernail off, it almost felt like they focus grouped that scene and they were just like, what will work well for American audiences? <laughs> something <laughs> gross. <laughs> Put something gross in right here. Well, I was reading too about that, that there's there's a long scene right there where there's no, di- I think this was it, where there's no dialogue. It was just really quiet where she's like in the bathtub like with her finger and again, I'm not a parent, but I feel like when young Simon or Simone came to the door and was like, come see Thomas's, there was a very weird little, it was very a lack of a conversation. I know the mom was in the middle of a party and she's like, come to the party or come eat or what, does she have a plate of food or something? She's a cake. A cake. And right. then she's like, come to the party. And the boy is standing there like in the sock mask and, and he's like, come see Thomas's little room. There was such a lack of conversation. I just feel like. And again, I'm not a parent, but just like, oh, honey, I'll come see your Thomas's house later in the middle of a party. Come on, let's get cake. I just, and I guess maybe that's not her style of parenting. Maybe she was just too stressed out about having this like, you know, party of prospective kids who were going to come stay at her orphanage. I, I just thought it was a little bizarre. I just, I liked the, the the fingernail ripping off in the bathtub, but I didn't, I was confused about like, and I guess the lack of conversation makes sense because she's not, you know, I don't know. But it, that was also like the last conversation they had. Yeah, it's the very so. last conversation they have. And there was no tender moment of anything like, you know, honey, just, sweetie, come see him later. Come on, they're having the party right now. Yeah. Which is like, Simone, come downstairs. Uh, uh. Right. <laughs> Not into the mom. Great acting, whatever. I just was like, too much frantic mom. She was no Hortense. <laughs> <laughs> I could not stop thinking about, you know, if you want to talk about like, you know, grieving mother tropes or worried mothers, which are in like, you know, every other horror movie. I just could not stop thinking of um, the bad seed from a couple episodes yeah. ago yeah. and like yeah. Hortense and like both mothers being so, like one is a murderer and the other one, their kid's dead. And I was like, she's no Hortense. Yeah. There's a lack of uh, play. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that's kind of confusing about this party to me is um, they state earlier in the movie that they can take five to six kids why are there like 60 people at this party? Mm-hmm, like, right. They are, they show like 10 They're gonna different They're going to break a kids. lot of hearts. Yeah. What, what's the deal with this? Who did you guys think was in the sack mask during this scene? Or who do you think it is now? The kid. Um, the hell's his name? Simone. Simone. Yeah. Yeah. I just assumed as much. And yeah, that was my, that was my guess at that particular point. I didn't think that at this point in the movie. I thought it was, I think we had already seen the drawing and we had been tipped off from Benina. So I thought it was not Simone at this point. Because he makes that like weird noise as he's walking. His little tittering noise. Yeah. (laughs) That's right. 
I watched this when I was in high school, and I'm pretty sure I thought it was Tomas at the time, but um, considering that Simone pushes her in, like, the scene before, Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm sort of more inclined to think it was Simone just, like, acting out after getting fucking slapped across Mm -hmm. the face for knocking over a cake. Yeah. Yeah, that was my interpretation, was they got into the fight... And then he went off and put on. I did, I still was confused about why he had Thomas's mask. And so when he's like just standing at the end of the hallway, I'm like, ooh, yeah. is that Thomas? I'm like, because it wasn't really clear if we were actually going to see the ghost, the children come alive. And we didn't really know what happened to them. Right. Um. But like with Allison just said, like with his reaction, I feel like it was him. Like at first I was like, oh, it's Thomas when I saw him. But then once he started interacting with her in the bath with the bathroom door. I was more inclined to think it was Simone, but I was also confused about how he got the mask from the potentially dead kid. Because we hadn't been shown what we what we know now, but I figured same form factor, yeah. kid size person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and did, it already, did it already happen in the movie when we found out that Tomas is Benina's kid? Did we already? Not yet. Okay. Um, also, when Laura puts the metal poles back in that uh, storage closet when she's looking for Simone, we view that from inside the closet, which is such a big clue in that moment. Which totally blew past me. I did not. I I figured there was probably some reason that they were showing us the contents of the closet and the clanking. Mm-hmm. I definitely didn't put together what we find out later. Mm-hmm. Same with me. Yeah. Well, in the pole, when she opened the closet looking for him and like the poles fell out. I was like, oh, those poles are dangerous. Those could totally fall on a child and hurt mm-hmm. them. Just from a parent point of view or an adult point of view. You I'm bet. Like, I'm like, those heavy things are going to fall on a kid. That's not exactly what happened, but it came into play later where they mm-hmm. got some damage. Yeah. It is basically what happens. So the police search the cave for Simone but find nothing. At the hospital, Laura meets Pilar. Who's Can I like, pause for one second yeah. and talk about the funniest transition I have ever seen that happens in oh, that with the flashlight? <laughs> I paused, rewound that like 10 times. I took a (laughs) video of it to send to my one friend because it was so ham-fisted and silly. At what point in the movie? When the cop, one of the cops that's searching the cave is panning across with his flashlight and there's this big hilarious lens flare that then transitions into the next scene. Right. I don't remember that at all. Oh, I. You were it, really focused on these lens flares. It stopped me. It stopped me dead <laughs> in my effects. tracks. Yeah, it was. It made me laugh a lot. <laughs> this movie is a comedy to Matt. <laughs> in that sense, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I laugh usually, and I like I like it when there are funny moments in horror. Yeah. And I didn't expect it to happen in this because it was like a sad, dark, depressing. It was oh, know, really the, dark. Yeah. And. But if there weren't any little hokey things for me to be like, hee hee about. I don't think I did it one time. I definitely, yeah, I was so giggling at did. technical <laughs> stuff. But, uh, but no, the story, not a not a laugh riot. But I did fall into Mystery Science Theater when Tyra was watching with me. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I started doing voices of yeah. everyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's oh, hear it. Oh, no. I, I, need, I need the video running. <laughs> we're changing the format of the show. We're yeah. not doing the, the laugh We're track. doing riff tracks <laughs> versions. <laughs> yeah. I was doing that. Lauren really hated it, but I was doing that during the new season of Stranger Things because I wasn't really enjoying it. So I was making fun of it the whole time. The <laughs> the last two episodes or just in general? The whole last season. Uh, I just kept saying, anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> He's got that Bob Saget body. <laughs> yeah, I did think you definitely poisoned my brain with that. Yeah, anyway. Oh. That's another episode. <laughs> That'd be a really different podcast. You guys ready to watch like eighty hours of? No TV? shit. Yeah. I did just rewatch the entire series, so. Um, oh, I, I have a si- I have a sidebar. I'll tell you guys about later. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we meet Pilar. Um, she suggests that maybe Simone was kidnapped by a relative, and they discuss Benina being at the house previously, where it's revealed that there is no social worker on record with the name Benina Escobedo. Back home, Carlos gives Laura his St. Anthony medallion and says to return it when they found Simone. Laura goes to investigate a loud banging sound that night and hears a loud crash. They search the house but only find a doll in Simone's bed. Lots of dolls. Spooky dolls. One thing is that medallion, and so St. Anthony is the patron saint of lost things. Yeah, Hmm. lost things, lost people, and lost souls. Yeah, so... And he gives her that pendant. And I was like, huh, that St. Anthony is the, you know, patron saint of love. I only know this from The Wire. Yeah, I was um, just going to say, I know it from a show. I just couldn't remember what it was. It's from yeah. The Wire. There's a, oh, I, I had to look ones. it up. Yeah. I only yeah. know this from The Wire. Like, yeah. yeah, I'm watching The Wire 74 times. It <laughs> paid off. 
Um, anyways, so, and that was an important thing. And it was a very small moment where she's like in a wheelchair on the top of the stairs. I don't know why she's oh, yeah. getting around the, wheel, the house Tempting in this wheelchair. Tempting fate with this fucking wheelchair right <laughs> yeah. by the stairs. And yeah. he like gives her the, the medallion. And I was like, oh, that's going to come into play later at some point. And I'm still like not. And I, after watching it, I'm like, duh, Peter Pan lost because the entire movie is this. And I didn't really think about it. And then so later on, like when the medallion comes back and there's yeah. more stuff with Peter Pan and Lost Kids and stuff. And I was like, oh, yes, she did the whole And it just all was tied yeah. up very beautifully at the end. And I did not mind the perfect tied up. Why were they doing their weird little grieving thing right there at the top of the stairs? Weird spot in the house to be doing that. Carlos just dragged her up there and they're both yeah. really tired. And he's just... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's not an ADA friendly like house a, at all. Was it a low angle, like looking up the stairs? Maybe it was just a cool angle that, that whoever was... Yeah. If yeah. you're I'm, a new cinematographer or whatever, yeah. like you're just like, oh, this yeah. is a cool angle. We haven't done one of those yet. Yeah, people hang out like this. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and I was like, is he going to push her down the stairs? It did look cool. Though. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was still just like, why? how is she getting around this? giant home in a wheelchair exactly like, why is she just not on crutches i don't know yeah 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 there's probably some out in that shed with all the other old things from there <laughs> <laughs> yeah Benina stole the crutches as she <laughs> hobbled away <laughs> there's definitely uh, one leg brace out there yeah mm-hmm. yep um i never noticed this until i watched it this time around but um there's the sound of a baby crying during the entire scene when laura's at the hospital Oh, I, did, I think I did is hear like that. thematically relevant because Simone is probably screaming his ass off downstairs. Hmm. Mm. I didn't think about it that. Yeah, but I, I heard didn't the baby. That. Yeah, why couldn't they hear? I guess you could hear the banging. You hear him trying to get their attention. I wonder what the walls are made of. Plaster. So, pa- apparently, just wallpaper. Yeah. yeah <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Laura also has a dream that night, which um, it's like her swimming and hearing a whistle noise, which is um, pretty similar to the way that Tomas would have died in the cave. Amanda, you just said wallpaper, and now I'm thinking back to the opening credits scene. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. See, Mm -hmm. I told you I'm... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> don't don't put things together Aww. but no that's that even that ties that together there's so a whole well. bonus footage thing just on creating the opening credits with green screens and kids hands yeah. reaching out the kids hands actually grabbed it right um, oh my Wait, God. What but they wanted to tie it together with the wallpaper what didn't you put together the fact that I, so I just I watched the opening credits and I just thought this is a cool way to show the opening credits. Yeah, with wallpaper ripping, mm-hmm. and I never put that together with the climactic scene of her going back in the closet. I didn't put that together she until to tear, just now. She has to so, tear the wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay, I think I like gl- maybe glanced away at that precise moment when she was in there. Yeah, because I was just like, "How did you not see that door?" So okay, how are you glancing away? Also, why did it was she a beautiful have... day outside. <laughs> why does she still have the doorknob in her pocket? I was just like, "Wait a minute, I, you yeah. conveniently know exactly what spot this." We're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, but yeah, it's cool because huh. like not only does she actually physically pull wallpaper away to find the door, but it's also thematically relevant, like mm-hmm. uncovering something that's already there that you can't see right all right that's pretty it was part cool, of the game because I, <laughs> I just thought man this yeah. is a really well, too- silly way to open a movie why did, why did they do that they spent a lot of money on that probably yeah they okay. did wow all right well, one thing too is if you think about huh. that was part of the game like she still had the doorknob in her pocket and the last clue was finding her kid like yep. there's a hole that was just part of the game yeah so i totally interrupted you alice yeah <laughs> i don't remember that. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, I have memory. the baby like was screaming. Seconds. Right. Um, oh, right, she right, has right. the dream about uh, Toma. Because Tomas also yeah. wears that whistle, right? Love a good underwater. Tomas wears the team. whistle? Mm-hmm. Uh, ben- Benina has the whistle. Right. I wonder if he would have had one too. He didn't wear it as a kid? He's not standing there creepy with his mask on with like a whistle? He and might. And then his, did his mom take it after he dies? I'm not sure. I don't really remember that. <clears throat> All right. So she's in the hospital. She's got. She comes home. He does have the whistle on it, around his neck. Does he? Maybe yeah. they both have one then. Yeah. Or maybe maybe Benina has. No, I don't know. Maybe well, there's two of them. I just th- well, because didn't he go missing? He was never found. They found him. Yeah. They found him in the cave. Yeah. He was hiding in the cave. Yeah. 
So they she he, she probably took because she was an adult mother at the time. So she, she took the whistle when From they found then. his body. Then she kept the whistle. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, um, but it, but, it made for a great sounds to hear that whistle. You mm-hmm. know, because yeah. and there was not a lot of music in the movie. They really wanted this the story to be told. Just like the the intention and tone was you to feel what was happening versus like the music forcing you to feel and think certain things, which yeah. movies do very effectively and it's gorgeous. But I did like the quietness, so you could hear the banging and the crying and the little, the sound, the things that were happening in the whistle, that little bumps in the night and yeah. all that. It's really good sound design. I think it. I think that's one of the Goyas that won was for best sound. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna talk about Spain's history at the end of this, and I think oh boy. there might be um, a couple details that'll make that make more sense. Yeah. Oh, I, get ready. I'm going off on a 20 minute fucking tangent. They love to use right. compression. anyway sorry (laughs) um the one other note i have for this scene is um when carlos gives laura the saint anthony uh medallion he says it'll bring them good luck and she says you don't believe that and carlos says something like exactly you do and so it'll work for you i just think that's pretty interesting well too Mm -hmm. when carlos gives laura the medallion simon's already missing and he he gives it to her and he says it's a present give it back when we find simon that's very important because at the very yeah. end, I'm like, why is dad right. walking in the room and picking up that freaking medallion? Right. And I didn't catch, I, when, yeah. I, when I watched that certain, I watched a couple of scenes again after I watched the full movie once and I went back and watched a couple of poignant scenes that I knew had literally said the same thing. And that was one of them. He says, give it back when we find Simon. So after, at the end when the mom is there and, or then she dies, then he walks in the empty room, the medallion's on the, on the ground and he picks it up and he smiles because she found Simon. Yeah. So I thought that was just beautiful. Sorry to say that right now, but yeah, yeah. That's but right. that he says yeah. that he says yeah. that in that scene, give it back when you find Simon. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff that like, as it happened towards the end, it endeared me to the movie mm-hmm. a lot more. Cause yeah. at this precise moment where we are, when he gives her that medallion, I was yeah, still yeah, so. not fully on board with this movie. Yeah. Well, it's so I was not either at the yeah. beginning and the whole movie in general, it's barely a horror. There's like not that there's barely anything that's scary. There's no gore. Like, it, but it's definitely more. I, I agree. But the whole time I was going, this is definitely more of a horror movie than A Tale of Two Sisters. Though. Really? Oh, for sure. I'm shocked by that. For sure. Okay. Man, I didn't think it dragged at all. Really? Yeah. Seriously, I, I think I was. I think the acting was so good mm-hmm. that it just really drew me in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it dragged because it was the mother running around frantic the whole time, and I was annoyed by that fact, <laughs> even if her pain was real. <laughs> but every time it's, but again, every time it started to drag, they would give me some other piece of story or some other set piece or cool camera thing that would make me go, all right, I'll, all right, I'll keep going. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Flash forward to six months later, which, oh. Everybody's favorite plot device. Yeah. Um, Carlos has maps and articles about Simone posted all over his wall. They attend a group for bereaved parents where Laura says that she thinks Simone's imaginary friends are in the house. The other parents say that they have also seen their children after death, but Laura says that that's not her situation. Her son is not dead. His friends took him. Um, she says she'll do anything to find her son. Um, Carlos and Laura drive to another town and see Benina pushing a baby carriage in the road. They try to follow her, but she's absolutely destroyed by an ambulance. <laughs> Unbelievable. I love that scene. I loved it. Did not expect that. And I was like, boom, El Smacko. Before they even showed her face, I, I when, you, when you could see him getting ready to do mouth to mouth, I was like, don't do it. That's good. You shouldn't do that. Yeah. There's no way to create a seal, bro. Yeah. yeah. But that, there was actually blood in that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. And I, her, I... I loved how they did show her jaw. There was body horror because they showed her jaw all disconnected and crooked and gross. Yeah. I... Loved it. My precise note at that moment was, she is dead as hell. Do not <laughs> do mouth to mouth. And then, yeah. in all caps, gross effect. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was. Um, yeah. That yeah. car accident scene was so shocking and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And two, for me, yeah. the point of the dad rushing in there and trying to save her he knew that bernina was the only key to like where her son was you know and when she was dead like there were no other clues right. like that he knew of the mom had all kinds of other things going on in her mind but the dad wasn't getting the same like 
wasn't having the same experience or looking for like you know Tom or um Simone's friends like the dad wasn't looking for the imaginary friends like did the dad even yeah like, you know that yeah. conversation I'm assuming was not happening so for me it was like that's was his immediacy of trying to to help her was because she was the key to finding his son right he was connecting pins and yarn on his crazy wall <laughs> <laughs> um they show that same room earlier and it's supposed to be a classroom for the kids mm-hmm. that's why there's like maps on the wall which he oh. like repurposes i did like also giving the dad more purpose or more i'm like oh the dad's involved the dad cares like he not that he didn't care but he was just so like he was sleeping and not doing this not yeah. doing that he was just like not really present yeah. he was present but just in a different way because the focus was so so much on the mom and yeah. simone and the kids and the, the imaginary friend so i did like the fact that the dad was obsessively trying to like find his son also he was off doing the like police work thing Mm -hmm. instead of the let's sage the fucking house thing (laughs) yeah yeah and and in that sense even though like he was i agree that he was absentee and weird i related more to that Mm because if if the if a kid went missing that was in my care i would be doing that not going let's bring somebody in with a bunch of monitors and see if we what we can see Yeah. yeah Yeah, you know, compared to other horror movies that I've seen, I thought the dad was more fleshed out and more interesting because I don't think he ever says, don't you think it's just in your mind, honey? Yeah. And so I thought he he had an interesting place in the movie, Mm -hmm. actually, even though I made fun of him earlier. (laughs) Um, Well, he was one of the other only, for the bulk of the movie, he's like the only other human that's in the house besides the mom, mm -hmm. like the actual living, breathing human. So you kind of needed that counterpart. You have the frantic mom, that's a trope in horror, and you've got like, you know, the medium coming in, and you've got the guys with their equipment doing their readings, and the, you know, the screens all go wonky (laughs) as the ghosts move around and stuff. (laughs) That's a great trope. Like, Uh they they just put a list of tropes, like, yeah, let's do them all. Um, But one of them is... Is, set all that shit but up. One, <laughs> man, is like, you're having some real production watching, issues just, over there. I couldn't help it. I was watching it <laughs> going, man, they had to set that up over a course of one fucking day, and there's yep. one tech that understands how it all works? <laughs> one hour. They say one hour. No yeah. fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, Matt is the resident production grump. Couldn't help it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I liked having the the two opposing viewpoints where you've got like, and that's in a lot of horror movies. Like, I it just you know, yeah. um, what is that one? I'm not gonna think of any right now. Um, really bad at pulling names out of my head and on the spot. Um, but where you have like the parents who are wanting to solve to find their kid, but there's two different things going on. Where one is like, hey, it's ghost. The other one's like, no, we're calling the police. They. It, it's like a pretty. Typical. Insidious. This oh, movie reminds me a right. lot of Insidious, yeah. which came after, which I just yeah. think I was going to say Inception, but yeah, Insidious. Yeah, hmm. it reminds me it has... of Poltergeist too, and yeah. the first mm-hmm. season of Stranger Things. Because yep. you have the opposing viewpoints, where it's like, yeah, it's ghost notes, missing called, kid, mm-hmm. ghosts, yeah. mm-hmm. etc. Yeah, I haven't seen Insidious. <gasps> oh, <laughs> oh, well, man, I put it on your for list. the listeners. Everybody is horrified. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the real horror. Of All this. right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Um, I, I will say I saw that my freshman year of college at Rave Cinemas, which is now what? Cinemark or Cinemark, something like that. Yeah. Um, and it truly scared me. I don't know that it would now, but um, yeah, I was I was really scared that night. <laughs> I cool. love Insidious. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's scarier than it's scarier than um, this movie that we're discussing today. It's scarier than cool. the Conjuring movies, too, if that's... Any. That's cool. Yeah. Mm, I, and it has the guy that's in a bunch of stuff like this, Patrick, yeah. Patrick Wilson. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. Um, I, well, I think, the, I think the Conjuring 2 is scarier than Insidious. Do you? Yeah. Hmm. Oh. Okay. I'll check it out. Anyways, yeah. yeah. you should. Yeah. Paid promotion. <laughs> um, but anyways, no, it just had the the missing the viewpoints missing kid like you know yeah. you've got to help the kid right i think it's like a pretty s- not standard but it's like man of science man of faith sort of dichotomy mm-hmm. where yeah. like yeah. he's a yeah. doctor yeah. he's trying to like put all the pieces together and do things sort of methodically mm-hmm. and like scientifically with proof and sh- that's just not how laura functions like she's all faith the kind of the kicker is laura is also right so mm-hmm. yeah, you yeah. you go through the whole yeah. movie. They're watching. always right. They're always <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Well, too with having these opposing viewpoints. I mean, this is the Mulder and Scully effect. Like you need this in a partnership, especially whether it's in these movies with you know parents or police or whatever. Like mm-hmm. you need these two opposing viewpoints to come together. In high school, I remember thinking Carlos was just like some like sort of deadbeat, nothing character. But um, this go around, I came up with what I think is like a kind of cool thing at the end, and it just gave me so much more respect for Carlos as a character in this. 
Pilar shows Laura a picture of the orphanage from Laura's childhood and asks her to identify the people in it. Pilar reveals that Benina worked at the orphanage for a short time and had a son, Tomas, who was born with a facial difference. Shortly after Laura was adopted, the kids went to the cave and took off Tomas's mask as a trick. He was so embarrassed that he never emerged from the cave and he drowned during high tide. Um, later that night, we see Laura in bed and someone gets in bed behind her. Laura recounts the story of when she and Carlos met Simone as a premature baby. Laura says she and Carlos are strong together and she apologizes to him, but then she realizes someone is in the bathroom. The door opens and it's Carlos and no one is in the bed behind her. The reveal of his face, he looks a lot like Jason Voorhees at the end of Friday the 13th Part 1. Yeah. Also a little bit like Cubone from Pokemon. <laughs> oh, oh, the kid? <laughs> yeah. No, don't say that because Cubone's mom. Uh, oh boy. The, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> That Let's was my note. Pokemon no, mythology. Yeah, he does look like Jason Voorhees. <laughs> <laughs> totally oh, fun. no. I wonder if that's intentional. And they only show his face a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not intentional, but but that was hey, that was Yoda my loves take. Pokemon. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Um, yeah, so the kids who took his mask and were picking on him, were they just off in the cave playing alone by themselves? They're all literally like between, what, you know, six and nine years old. They are small children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, you know. It's a long way to the cave, too. Yeah. Also, the lighthouse is not real. That's That was added in post, and that made me really upset. It but wasn't. No, no. I know. Yeah. It was. It's, all, it's all fake. It's all fake. It was, it's just fine. Yeah. It looked like a PlayStation 2 game. <laughs> but that's uh, okay. It, it does. Um, that's probably where Laura learned her parenting skills. <laughs> the folks at the orphanage like, yeah, I don't know. Go play in the cave. Yeah. That's all there is to do is run around the, the cave yard and watch go to the em. cave. <laughs> If I was a kid, I'd be going to the cave all the time. I mean, absolutely. But also, the tides seem pretty awful. If you can't really navigate to the cave, like she was trying to get to the cave, and the the tide came up and mm-hmm. like broke her leg. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I think this um, like reveal is interesting for a lot of reasons, but um, it kind of sets up the idea that the kids playing can have deadly consequences, and there's like an element of danger, um, which until you know how it ends. Um, Makes it a little more spooky, I would mm-hmm. say. I will. I'm going to go back for one second. The scene where we all got caught up in the Jason Voorhees, the mask effect. <laughs> but that scene where she was talking, like I figured somebody was not in the bed, like a not, her husband wasn't in the bed, and I didn't know if they were actually going to show one of the ghosts actually in her bed. Right. And so the whole time I was sitting impatiently just watching, and I'm like, who's in her bed? Who's in her bed? And that was one of the, she was being very open and very sincere, and it would have been a good time for her husband to be in the room because they would have had that connection like they did at the, briefly in the piano scene earlier. Um, but I knew it wasn't her husband, but, and I was slowly, and I wasn't afraid. I was just like, yeah, something's in there. This is cool. Mm-hmm. So I, I appreciate it. I'm like, oh, cool. There's a bit of a spooky part happening finally. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I have a theory about who that was, but it's, I, it's all, not, I think it's, Simone asked twice at the beginning of the movie if he can sleep with her. Mm-hmm. Oh. So and so, I think it's him. I think he just crawls into bed with his mom. Makes sense. Laura attends a paranormal lecture. She meets with the speaker afterward and tells him what's happened with Simone. He offers to connect her with a medium. The medium arrives to the house, and it's Geraldine Chaplin. <laughs> she sets up the room for a psychic summoning as Pilar arrives. Um, her staff explains... Parallel perception, which is explained to be past, present, and future superimposed and cross like a sort of time travel. They hold the psychic summoning and hear children screaming and crying that they've been poisoned and are dying. This is where I wrote, oh, good, Ghostbusters. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And are they doing this pro bono? Are... What is their going rate? And then also, that is a lot of equipment to set up, (laughs) which we already covered. Mm -hmm. Can't wait till you watch Insidious. Oh, yeah. Is there a lot of equipment in that? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No spoilers. No spoilers. A lot of CRT monitors and stuff. Um, Um, I also wrote, stop huffing that doll, you creep. (laughs) Um, And yeah. All in all, though, this scene was pretty effective and pretty good. And even though it did feel like, hey, let's cram another trope into this movie, um, it was still pretty well done and it still found a way to be tense. And obviously the sound of children being upset and screaming mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. is always going to mm-hmm. work yeah, in a movie. Yeah, be upsetting. Um, and it definitely yeah. did. And I think, and we needed, we needed um, her point of view because she was able to talk to the mother about, you know, 
seeing is believing, believing is seeing. Like she really mm-hmm. needed, if she, if you believe it, you'll be able to see it because she still can't see. She right. wants to see her son. She wants to see them. Right. Like, and so the medium is the one who needed to tell her, you know. Oh, also, how, <laughs> this is dumb, but how is drawing her path on that map going to be helpful <laughs> in any way later? I loved all those shots of the blueprint. Yeah. So, where it's, it's very just scientific. The, the tech just drawing a single line around this room. Like, what are they going to do with that later? It's no sense. But then yeah. at the very end, did you see how he just scribbles in that yes, dot? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Notes. This is where it happened. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, and everything looks scary in night vision. Like that oh, just, that just right. immediately. And that, I, that's true in any horror movie. The second they switch to night vision, you know, something bad's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least something scary is going to happen. So even though we have seen scenes like this so many times in other horror movies, I still thought they did some neat things here. Like with the interaction of characters in a worse movie, There'd be a whole debate between Pilar and the medium. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And actually, Pilar is a pretty sympathetic character in this, even though she's from the police and represents science and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there isn't this expected debate going back and forth between this is crap and everything, you know, whatever. <laughs> That's kind of the dad's job, you know, later right. on. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway, I kind of liked the whole treatment of Pilar and her character. So... I love the line where Gerald and Chaplin is like, oh, yeah, cops are cool. Oh. Like, what? Because <laughs> they ask if Pilar can join them, and she's she, like, whips around and is like, yeah, cops are cool. <laughs> Weird. Was, I missed that. It was yeah. so odd. I yeah. remember that line, too. Huh. It's disappointing to me that we don't see anything, although I think that kind of ties into the theme. But um, I hate the screaming, and I hate... Aurora's face when she opens the door and like the everything like ramps up and it gets super loud. Her face is like horrifying to me it, with all the like green night mm-hmm. vision stuff. Yeah. Afterward, Aurora gives them the rundown of what happened. Carlos doesn't believe any of it. Um, Carlos and Pilar say that the paranormal team needs to leave. Laura says that the police haven't found anything in months, and she didn't invite Pilar, so actually Pilar can leave. Oh, (laughs) Everyone except for Carlos and Laura leaves. (laughs) Laura goes outside to talk to Aurora. When she comes back, Carlos is tearing down his Simone wall. He says they can't stay there any longer and they should leave. He says Enrique was fiddling around with the wires for an hour and that this was probably a setup. He begs Laura to leave with him, and she says he can't ask her that. She says, I just want to be with Simone. Don't you understand? An hour, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And then he just leaves her there. Yeah, that, that felt bad. Definitely not, not a cool dude move. Yeah, I didn't. That was like the second note I wrote. Like literally, the building is cool. The husband leaves the wife that alone after they find the bodies. What? Well, he hasn't quite left yet. All right, mm. sorry, I keep jumping ahead. No, that's all right. Well, it's confusing because those two scenes are almost slow and boring, identical. and I didn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm just <laughs> noticing parts. I do think Carlos has an interesting point where, like, if Simone is alive, these people can't help them, and if he's not, they're not going to be able to recover him anyway. So his point is sort of good. Like, Well, also, he's dead because he hasn't had his medication in right. over mm-hmm. six months. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yep. They set up before it would take many weeks. Right. But, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, they set that up. Yeah. That's why that six-month-later thing is such a gut punch because you automatically know, like, uh, chances are slim that they're going to find this But, kid. you know, mm-hmm. the dad still has to have some hope because he has the whole room dedicated to his son, that giant wall, and the he adds more and more over time. You see that wall having mm-hmm. some articles and some pictures, then it just gets bigger and bigger. And at the last shot of it, like, that room is giant and dedicated to, to Simone. So he has to have some hope that he maybe got lost in the cave or something. Like, maybe he's out there somewhere. Yeah. Um, and does is not dead because he ha- hasn't had his medicine. Because as a parent, like, whether... You still have to have hope. Even though you know your son has a disease and will die if he doesn't get his medication, like, you still have to have hope. Even if they find, like, the bloody this or the bloody that. Like, even in real life circumstances of parents who have missing children, like, they spend, like, years and decades. Like, if they haven't found a body, my kid is still out there and alive and they are now 30 years old. Like, so, yeah. I, so I could see why they both would 
with the different the Mulder and Scully points of view of like yes and no believing in ghosts and not believing in ghosts mm-hmm. he's still going to be hopeful you know what I mean yeah you know the actress who plays um, Laura actually met with a family whose daughter had been missing for <gasps> nine years oh my gosh oh, to, as like um, research ahead of oh. time and she's quoted as saying um, you can see that their lives changed the moment she disappeared you keep changing as time passes because at first you're thinking it's not possible it's not true you don't believe the reality. Afterward, you say, well, I have to find him. But as the days go by, the hope is falling. You think it's impossible, but you just have to keep looking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God, I hope that the studio paid that family some good money. Because oh, I, I couldn't imagine. I would be so insulted if somebody's like, hey, your kid's missing. Can I research it for a role? Yeah. I've heard of other productions having the actors go to like group therapy sessions and just pretending that they right. are... Right. Supposed oh. to be there. Sure. Right. Which I, yeah, that's not right. Woof. Mm. Um, so Laura asks where Simone is. She says she's not afraid. The window breaks and she finds those dolls underneath, which is another little clue. Um, and it leads her on another treasure hunt, like earlier in the game, or sorry, earlier in the movie. Um, the last clue is a doorknob that Laura, Laura doesn't recognize. She goes out to the shed to see if the doorknob fits there and realizes Benina was in there for a reason. She breaks open the little locked wooden door and discovers the remains of all of her friends burned to ashes. Great scene. Yeah. Um, afterward, Pilar shows Laura more <clears throat> random 16 millimeter footage that she has and didn't show her earlier, <laughs> which shows that Benina poisoned the kids after Tomas's death. Carlos says he's leaving, and Laura asks for two days alone in the house to say goodbye. And that's where he leaves. That's, that's a lot of stuff that just happened in that. Yeah, that you bet. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, she was covered in those ashes uh, yes. when she was out there. Oh, my God. She keeps touching her face, too, and it's yep. like, oh, my God. Get there in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great scene, and, too, at first she's just trying to move the giant, what are those bags of something? She's moving those yeah. bags, and she, she opens that that hole in the wall and there's that shot of her like it's through the tunnel or little cave little yeah. kind of a little opening mm-hmm. um a hallway if you will but it's very small and you can i love the shot of her like at the end of it yep and i'm like oh is there a body in there is like tomas at the end is like i was wondering if she was going to find like or finally see like a ghost of a kid or right. her kid's body or something so i love that scene and then there's a skeleton and i, I thought it was a good scene me too and i like that we were back in the shed because it tied into earlier with Benina. Mm-hmm. Some good foreshadowing. And it was claustrophobic, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I always get creeped out um, in that moment where um, it, it's like the camera's inside that thing you were talking about. Mm-hmm. The, like, not hallway, mm-hmm. but like the long. Yeah, it just creeps me out. I feel it's like there's like, something watching her or something. Yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah. you don't know. I love that she uses her broken leg to kick open the wooden door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's months. It's months later. She's healed. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> it's, it's six months later. Nine months she's later. like, "This is already fucked." Yeah. Yeah. And also, I love how too she's still on this mission on her own. Like she is out there in the shed, like on her own. Yeah. You know. Right. I mean, she calls the cops after her finally, but. Um, I also think the treasure hunt is pretty genius because we already saw all of the pieces before. We know that that's Simone's first ice cream after he had his tonsillectomy right. or whatever. Mm-hmm. We saw her quilting when they're having the Wendy and Peter Pan uh, conversation mm-hmm. earlier. Mm-hmm. And then it's confusing because she pulls out that doorknob and we haven't seen it either. She doesn't know what it's to either. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But she she it's in her pocket later on. See, part of the reason I love Crimson Peak and this movie so much, it feels like an escape room, both of these movies, mm. like with this treasure hunt. You just went to an escape room, Christopher. I know I did. Before you watch this movie. That, th- <laughs> yes. Did you really? Yeah, I really did. Here in town? No, in Barcelona. <laughs> oh, right. On your fancy... <laughs> it's in Spain. Oh, my... What? In the movie? What? Oh. <laughs> and here we are in Spain at this orphanage. <laughs> But it's seriously, it feels like this immersive, interactive thing that you're doing, both the treasure hunt here and everything in Crimson Peak, you know, and they keep focusing on keys Mm -hmm. in this movie, in the orphanage. There are so many close-ups of keys. So it just, anyway, I I love how it pulls the viewer in. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. No, but if you think about it, like the treasure hunt, this game of finding six things, then finally it is a, it is an escape room, Christopher, because right. you've got to get the key at the end, open the door, and then you're released. Right. And this is you've got to find the, the pieces of this, and at the end they find like the 
um, the folder where he finds out he's adopted. And then she finds the door and which ends up being a huge piece to like the end. Mm-hmm. It is an escape room. But I also think it's amazingly timely and poignant that you watch this literally after you're in an escape room in Spain. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. <laughs> the other so time amazing. that we see a key is when uh, Simone pushes her and he shows the key up against the window of the bathroom door. Right. Oh, yeah. Locking you in. Um, in that, um, when L- Laura grew up featurette um, that's on the DVD, yep. um, the director talks about how Benina represents the darkest thing that Laura's character could become because they're both mothers who have lost their children. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he always thought that if Laura were to end up differently, she'd be just like Benina. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. The other thing I think is kind of funny is um, like... This part of the movie is cool because she could just be, like, losing her mind and, like, making stuff up at this point, which I think we see so often in movies, especially right now. Like I'm Enough that about... that's what I assumed was happening yeah? at a couple mm-hmm. of points. Yeah, just just because it, it, you know, that seemed like that's an easy way out in a yeah. movie like this. But... I, I think it's possible, but, um, like, watching it through, knowing what happens, there's so many coincidences that, like... I, I don't, I don't know. It, like, it seems like it's happening the way that we see it. Mm-hmm. It seems like it's all real. I was really nervous watching this whole movie because I thought, okay, there are a bunch of crazy different things happening. There's the cave, there's the boy, there's whatever, you know, is she crazy? Is it in her mind? How are they going to tie all of these bits together at the end? Mm-hmm. And I think they totally succeeded. Mm-hmm. I agree. And so the whole movie, I'm like, oh man, the more wacky stuff you throw in here, the harder it is going to mm-hmm. be to tie it up and satisfy me, mm-hmm. right? You know. And then they did. It was the per- and as a person who's not super into this movie, it was very well written and in so many. And afterwards, rewatching the couple scenes I watched, they literally say the same sentences. They set everything up for you. Yeah. Um. And normally, I'm not into the whole perfect bow, great ending, but the way they did that, it just really. I loved how in the ending, the last 20 minutes made me think like, okay, I'll give it more than like one and a half stars. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I felt, it, I totally felt the same way. Yeah. So yep. and then I really appreciated it, and I loved the Peter Pan lore and story. So that. Yeah. For having that be in here, because I do like those fantastic pieces, making you think I would like Pan's Labyrinth. That's why I freaking watched it. But I still have issues with a lot of things. Gonna keep hmm. that inside my head for now. Um, <laughs> no tangents here. You can yeah. let loose at um, the end when we read it. That's right. <laughs> no, anyway, so I do think it was very well written, and then all those pieces came into play. Like they were purposeful. Right. For sure. The next scene is Laura dressing in the clothes from the old orphanage and playing <sighs> the game with the kids. And then one of them leads her to the storage closet underneath the stairs. Uh, Thomas's office of child trickery. <laughs> um, that was his, he was he had to live in there because his face was deformed and he wasn't allowed know, to be with I the know, other kids. I know, I know. They hid him. I know. <laughs> they hid him in that room. What a fucking nightmare. Yeah. I do love the game. Like when she's playing the game with the kids. When she started like getting dressed up like she was as a child and she also doesn't she put on Benina's whistle I think so mm-hmm. but yeah. she's putting on she's dressed as a child she goes and picks berries she sets up the whole table inviting the six kids or whatever to come and play with her and she doesn't see it and I'm still waiting for these kids to show up I wanted I want I want evidence I want to see them um and so I love and she says she's just frustrated and mad and she screams and she goes you know she wants to believe she goes I believe I'm here where are you and then she has to like you know go and hear things and stuff but I did like how she was going back into and part of it was because I'd seen some of the visuals from watching the um, those little um super eight video things or whatever 60 millimeter film we had to watch of, of when they were kids mm-hmm. and so for me I was trying to put that lens on like watching it through that point of view even though she was an adult I was trying to imagine her as like you know a kid I love the recreated supper scene as well yeah uh, you know and just putting everything back the way it was the old beds mm-hmm. the food and then she's digging in that sugar bowl, and she just can't get any goddamn well, sugar. And those, bowl. Are, <laughs> and those are the beds. Off. Those are the beds from the shed. Like she went to the shed. Right. We saw those white beds right. in at the beginning. In the room mm-hmm. she was setting up the, the new orphanage, she wanted to set up like their bedroom was in a completely different room. So she had to take the old room. And again, she's all by herself in this giant, you know, mansion orphanage, and she's putting together six child's beds who haven't been put together in thirty years. Uh, no effort whatsoever. 
I did. I, it just had some issues. I didn't, just really wasn't there for this whole part. And until she got to the closet and stuff started happening, I was just like. And then also, were the kids poisoned by berries? Did Benina poison them? I wonder because they kept showing you the berries that it yeah. had to be that. But yeah. and I thought, is she trying yeah. to poison them? They're already dead. Like, right. I was confused. And they were giant <laughs> bowls of berries in front of all six plates. I was yeah. very. Like focused on those berries. Gonna have a tummy ache. Allison, tell me something about the berries. <laughs> no, I think you're exactly right. I think she used them to poison the kids. Also, it sounds like Laura is the girl you want to call when you uh, go to IKEA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> like, where are all the nuts? Like, literally, I'm, you're worried about like the production. I'm like, how do you put those those old crickety beds together? Oh, like, <laughs> don't worry. I was upset about that too. <laughs> and she's just all perfect, not a sweat. Everything, yeah. every bed is made. Yeah. And I'll, I love yeah. how all the dolls are on all the beds. Like, she, it's a great setup to invite them back in to play, yes. play with her. So I did like it at that point. Once everything was ready, yeah. I was like, okay, now what? That whole sequence really does move things along, though, which is good. I was willing to go with the fact that she's like, oh, you're just slamming that bed frame together and it's fine. <laughs> How's that holding itself up? But yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you notice how many beds she sets up? Were there six or seven? Eight. Eight? There's one for her and Simone. Um. Um. I never included her, but when I was counting the kids, I was counting between six and seven, adding Simone in there. And then, of course, we are at sort of the reveal of the movie. Laura finds the hidden door in the back of the closet. Um, The doorknob she found earlier fits. She descends down the stairs to find Tomas's little room, which is the room he lived in. Um, She finds Simone alive and tells him that she'll get him out. The camera spins around as she tells Simone to remember before they came to the orphanage all the things he can look forward to and that the orphans aren't real. They squeeze their eyes shut, but when Laura opens her eyes, Simone isn't there anymore. His body lies on the floor behind her, and she realizes that the day he went missing, she accidentally locked him in when she moved the metal pipes back into place in the storage closet, and then he fell down the stairs and died trying to get out. And he's wearing the mask still. Yeah, I think that's probably where he found that outfit is by visiting mm-hmm. Tomas's little yeah. room earlier. All of that was amazing. When she was in the room and unlocked the door, she ripped open the wallpaper and put, I, again, I was annoyed. I'm like, you just got the doorknob in your pocket. I get, it makes it sense because it's part of the game and she has to have it. I'm like, oh, you magically touch one part of the wall and rip apart the <laughs> wallpaper and there's the hole for the key to fit in. Um, no suspension of disbelief on my part whatsoever. And I believe in fantastical, <laughs> magical, and wonderful things. Um, but I did love when we went down to that room and saw all of his drawings of the kids and stuff and... I felt really bad. I was in Thomas's mind and I felt really bad for him like being a child with this facial deformity where he was not allowed to be with the other kids and his mom worked there. So he was just like, he was an orphan. His mom worked there and he was just like hidden in the basement. And I felt really sad for him and his mom. Mm -hmm. I hate this like sort of trope in movies because there's, I understand it was probably like the seventies, but there's really no reason he had to be kept separate. It just really bothers me. Like he could have lived a better life and he wouldn't have died if that had been true. Mm -hmm. Right. So before all this, though, remember, I know we just barely touched on Benny, um, Laura playing the game again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you guys like that? Was it scary at all? Oh, yeah. Was it scary to you guys? Not scary, but it. Um, I thought, it, well, I wrote one, two, three, cheap scare. <laughs> <laughs> but, then it, but then it wasn't a scare. That's the title then of it was just, oh, the, oh, there they are. You know, yeah. it, like I was worried that it was going to be like, it's the kids, but they have fangs or something. <laughs> but it was just the kids. And then they, so actually I ended up liking that. This is about the point where every reveal or every sequence that happened kind of bumped the number or letter grade up for me mm-hmm. a little mm-hmm. bit. Mm-hmm. Huh. And like as horrifying as the reveal is um, that he was accidentally killed that day, that that solidified it as, oh, I actually liked this movie because that mm-hmm. is a brave fucking choice. I really like that also it was an absolute, like this movie didn't end with us wondering where the ghost is, yep. is someone real, is he not real, is he dead, is she, who's dead? I like that it was, because everything that she went through, the mother, it, I don't want to say that it validated her, but it just like, she had closure, she knew yep. her son had died and she felt terrible because when she finds her body, she goes through in her mind the noises she heard and like, they kind of recreate like how we get, how the door gets locked and how we, yeah, I just felt and I did like that from a movie goer point of view of watching a movie and knowing that there was a because a lot of movies where there's ghosts or spooky houses there is no ending about who's real and who's not real and and here I did like that where there was that closure like okay yep he's dead. Her walking down the staircase is the scariest part of the movie when it like shows this staircase and there's just like a hole that she's descending down. Something about that shot just like freaks me out. 
Sure. It's so black. Yeah, I hate this. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that he's alive first, or he seems to be alive. Mm-hmm. That did make me laugh just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, he's just been chilling down there. He's just having a little snooze for yeah. seven months or whatever. <laughs> but I did like the moment she had with him where, and she does mention Christmas again. Mm-hmm. She was thinking about next Christmas. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But I also... When, like, he actually is a dead body, like, he's been down there for a long time. Like, he should be a little ripe and a little really with, I mean, there are, when she you first sees him. You see a couple him, of flies. When she and, first sees yeah. him, but later on, like, maybe this is just, like, the fantastical part of the movie. She's just carrying him around, and he's just, like. He, he's a little wrinkly. Yeah, he's <laughs> not a he's lot, pretty though. dry. Yeah, he should he's, be, yeah. yeah he's pretty, he should be a little more He should corroded. be puffy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. seven months. Yeah. And she kisses him. Whew. Yeah. She's his mother. I know, but the flies are CGI. How funny is that? Oh my gosh! <laughs> Couldn't get Matt. good fly actors. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Goldblum was busy. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. Yeah. Um, yeah. But great again, Matt. I totally agree. This this is my redemption part. I loved everything that's happening, and there's even cooler stuff that's about to happen. Yeah. Like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This yep. this just it really all just worked for me by the end. Yeah, I sat up a little bit. I was like, okay, paying further attention. Cool stuff's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I still would consider it a, a day ruiner of a movie, um, yeah. but still pretty good. Pretty pretty cool the way they wrap that up. A fact to ruin your day currently. Oh, stop. Um, I hate her scream when she finds him, and that is the scream of an actress who has lost a child in real life. <gasps> what? Yeah, her second born child died within the first year of her life. Why on earth? What? Can, a, can an actress not scream? <laughs> Why do they what? need to put that poor mother through? What? It... It's like the beginning of Blowout. What is that? The movie Blowout? Oh. Never heard of we'll it. Get it. We'll get into that. Another okay, time. sidebar. <laughs> wow. Imagine setting up that appointment, booking a studio to have somebody come in and like, all right, now transform yourself back to when your kid died. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's why that's my t- mouth is agape. That's ridiculous. Like, literally, what? And she had to go and talk to a mother who had a missing child. And now she, I guess that's like part of whatever acting. And nothing about that scream stuck out to me is scream. like, yeah. Drew weird. Barrymore can scream. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. weird. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That's weird. I'm, here, I'm like, glad you told us that. I'm just like, that's so interesting. It doesn't ruin, it doesn't ruin the scene for me because I don't, I don't even remember her scream. But it just is bothering me that. A couple interesting things about the. That whole quote when the um, camera's circling around that mm-hmm. I'll bring up later. Yeah, so isn't this fun, you guys? <laughs> it's a fun movie. A real, a real, a caper, a romp. Um, Laura brings Simone's body upstairs. She says, this isn't fair. I found him. She takes a bunch of pills and dies. Um, and the last thing she does is pulls off her St. Anthony medallion. Um, we hear rumbling, and the lighthouse begins to shine. Laura wakes up and says, I want Simone back. He comes back to life and says his wish is for Laura to stay and take care of all the kids. The other orphans enter the room, and they're all reunited as Laura begins to tell them a story, and they bring it back to the Peter Pan and Wendy discussion from earlier. We're also treated to another one of those hilariously bad transitions. There's a beacon to sunrise <laughs> one that made me laugh. <laughs> I love that whole scene, and this is where my brain was totally tying into all the Peter Pan, the, the medallion, the lost kids, and then she played the game, and she found the and the last clue. She found him. He was the last piece, and she got to make it. They both. She got to make a wish, and he got his wish too. They both played the game and finished it, and found the thing and made the wish. I just lapped yep. that up with a little bloody spoon because I thought it was. <laughs> for me, it just it made the movie palatable and more than one and a half stars. I just like loved all of this part where totally things agreed. all came together and I'm like, oh, she played the game and she won and she got to make the wish and now they're reunited and it's yeah. still weird because she's like an adult and then she becomes one of, you know, the eighth orphan yeah. or whatever now and they're going to live happily or be dead happily ever together. Um, yeah, she she seems delighted and totally content mm-hmm. to be dead. Yeah, Carlos is gone. She just wanted to be with her son. And she says right. it earlier, she's like, I just want my son. Well, right. this is also what she wanted from the beginning. She wanted an yep. orphanage where she would take care of five to six mm-hmm. kids. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a shitty way to get it. But. Yeah. Oh. It's weird because it really does play as like a happy ending. But then you think about it and you're like, oh. It's not. Yeah, it's yeah. just like a happy overdose ending. 
Yeah. <laughs> like half this family just died. It's a yeah. rare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And after so after watching the last 20 minutes, the whole time I was like, okay, I need to go back and rewatch the beginning. And I didn't want to watch the entire movie again, but I went back and watched like the very intro where the kids are playing that game. I wanted to see how the game won again. And I rewatched the scene um, of the dad giving her the medallion. And I really wanted to find that. I didn't want to watch the whole thing. And I was just scanning through and I magically found that scene. And I watched the scene of them discussing the Peter Pan book again. Um, and that's where the kid says, it's a game. Finding what they took from you, you find the clues. And if you find it, they grant you a wish. And so that took me back to that. Um, they steal your treasure. They steal something love. And then you have to find it. Mm-hmm. And that's happened to him. And so for me, just watching that Peter Pan conversation about like, you know, mom, when are you going to die? That kind of thing. Um, I like that part because literally like word for word was like the same thing. So it brought it back. Yeah. Mm. yeah it's, it's like the movie Beautiful with Javier Bardem. Only, <laughs> only with the little horror and little orphan Annie thrown in. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen, seen that movie. I know what you're talking about. Oh, though. it's it's great. <laughs> yeah. Is Benicio it's, it's, Del Toro involved? No, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's another great movie to watch on a beautiful day with butterflies flying <laughs> around <laughs> to wreck it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, in the closing scene, Carlos leaves two red roses at the gravestone for Laura, Simone, and all the other children. He goes inside, finds the St. Anthony's medallion. The door opens, he looks up, and he smiles. And that is the end. They definitely they stuck the landing with this one, for yeah. sure. Well, because at first when we saw the gravestone, the memorial... And I was like, oh, yep, and it'll be an end. And then when the dad went back into the house, I was mad. I was like, why is he going back <laughs> in the house? No, it should have ended on the gravestone. But then when he picked up yep. that freaking medallion and he smiled because he said to her, give it back when you find Simon. And yep. she found him and gave it back. I just thought that was a beautiful little yep. little, little bit. Really mm-hmm. appreciated that. Yep, worked, worked really nicely. And it worked so much better for me than an M. Night Shyamalan movie. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I... I I detest those movies <laughs> so much, but you know, people would argue, well, he you know wraps everything up and all the clues are there. But in this movie, it all fits logically and makes good sense. You're puzzled, and then you get to the end, and it all fits wonderfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I really think it was like a passion project for like the writer. Like this was he wrote it like what the, like the ninety three. Yeah. Oh, so wow. I, I just think, and plus if the Simone was based on him, and it had, and the main the 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 imaginary friends that are the dead orphans that he, um, Simone is communicating with and seeing and playing with, those are different. Like he has these other two friends at the beginning of the movie that are like his real ima- his his real imaginary friends before he has the dead imaginary <laughs> friends. Um, his real imaginary friends. If those are like the like, I feel like it's a very personal thing for the and it was a long time coming for the for the project to get put together. And so it made sense to me that like every little note of like the the dialogue or just some of the the games and how things came together and it was sort of like full circle. The bottom of the gravestone is made of white seashells. Which I noticed that. Oh, I yeah. didn't notice yeah. that. That's cool. <laughs> you have to rewatch it. Dang. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys make of the last shot of Carlos looking up? When he looks up and smiles? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's just a realization that Laura is with Simone because he just found mm-hmm. the St. Anthony's. And so he's happy. And I wasn't quite sure how I felt about that, just because it it it's nice, but it almost felt a little hallmarky, yeah, mm-hmm. just a little bit. I'm not sure how mm-hmm. I would end it. You know, if I was the director, what kind of a mood I would want on the end of it. But he could have just looked at the Saint Anthony's necklace and just looked away puzzlingly mm-hmm. instead of smiling. And I just wonder what that would do. But him smiling is the realization that they were both in a safe place. Right. The room he's standing in is also empty. So all of the beds and everything that were set up in there are gone. Mm-hmm. So one thing I thought was like, oh, did she actually put those beds together in that room? Or is this like months and months and months later, the room, the house has been cleared out. And that's why he's not freaking out when he finds the medallion and realizes that, you know what I mean? It's like, um, it is a hallmarky moment. And I didn't, I did not mind it. Like, I feel, feel like in other movies I may have, but for this one, mm-hmm. Just with the fantastical like elements of like you know the game and the kids and the Peter Pan stuff, it just it worked. And at first, I was mad. I wanted it to end on that gravestone, mm-hmm. but I really liked that the ending. I like. I, what did you feel, Allison? 
Um, so when I watched this in high school, I thought that he literally saw them. I like I thought the door opened and he saw their ghosts. Oh. Mm. But I don't think that's true because in the mythology of this movie, like you have to be close to death to see the ghosts. And th- there's no reason for me to believe that he is going to die. But I think that it ties into the theme of seeing is not believing, believing is seeing. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. he believes in this shit now. Mm-hmm. I think he's crossed over from being a man of science to being a man of faith. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think he knows that his wife and kid are still there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just took him a little bit longer to sort of like wake up to that fact. But we already know that Carlos has a h- hard time waking up to things from mm-hmm. the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah, isn't that interesting? No, that all works 100%. And I think he got hit by the van that hit the lady with the whistle necklace. Hell yeah. <laughs> that was Carlos the a- is the real ghost. <laughs> that was the after credits scene that we all missed. Right, exactly. He just yeah. dove in front. I think it's an ambulance that hits her, which is just kind of That's funny. Extra it funny. is an ambulance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a great scene. Yeah. Yeah. But I did, I did, I'd appreciate the lack of, even, it wasn't necessarily spooky and scary, but I liked the quietness of it. I liked the beautiful shots of it. Um, I did like the lack of, blood and gore and i like all of that in horror um but i just like that you weren't using that to to as the reason to be afraid right. of what was happening you know right but i did want some blood from that fingernail being ripped off they used oh, it yeah. and all that was used pretty effectively yeah all right well time for me to go off on a crazy tangent all right <laughs> We're going to school okay you better talk about peter pan let me give you just like a quick rundown of the past hundred years of spanish history In 1931, Spain decides that they're tired of having a king, and they hold local elections, riot to remove the monarchy, the king flees, and suddenly we're in the Second Spanish Republic. Five years later, in 1936, the Spanish Civil War starts with a military coup led by Francisco Franco, who launches a partially successful uprising aimed at overthrowing the country's democratically elected republic. A very bloody civil war ensues. There's a massive amount of violence on both sides in the battlefield and on city streets, including murder, assassinations, executions, rape, public humiliation, mob violence, and torture. Folks who supported the left-leaning Republicans or their values were imprisoned and executed, and their children became orphaned. Millions of Spaniards were displaced and later became refugees, but few countries would accept them. Many were later deported to Nazi concentration camps. It's unknown and controversial as to how many people died during the conflict, but it's likely somewhere in between half a million to a million people, not including those who died of starvation, malnutrition, or disease related to the war. In 1939, Franco and the Nationalists win. Franco continues to rule Spain via dictatorship until his death in 1975, so for another 36 years. In the years after the Spanish Civil War and throughout the 1940s, the Franco estate was severely repressive, with an escalation of torture, illegal detention, and execution. Nationalists would hunt down protesters, or those who were labeled a threat to the government and believed to sympathize with the Republican cause. And I have a quote here from Angela Guarino. She says, Waves of these individuals were condemned on mere hearsay without trial loaded onto trucks, taken to deserted areas outside city boundaries, shot and buried in mass shallow graves that began dotting the Spanish countryside. Within this time period, there's this idea of the lost children of Francoism, who were the children abducted from Republican parents who were either in jail or had been assassinated by nationalist troops during the Spanish Civil War and Francoist Spain. The number of abducted children is estimated to be up to 300,000, and they were sometimes also victims of child trafficking and illegal adoption. In addition to this, many parents sent their children to foreign countries out of concern during the Spanish Civil War. After winning the war, Franco declared that those children needed to return to Spain with or without their parents' permission. And in 1940, A law passes that states that the legal authority of children in facilities belonging to human rights group social aid would automatically be transferred to the state, which created a risk that parents that sent their children to foreign countries might forever lose their legal rights to their children. Victims groups have also stated that kidnapping babies developed into a business that continued into the 1980s. Nurses and other people have admitted to illegally adopting babies with hospital staff, nuns, and priests 
being suspected of being part of an organized network. The Spanish Catholic Church had an important role in hospitals and social services at the time, and in many cases, parents were told that their children had died within the hospital or in childbirth. And since the hospitals took care of the burials, they never saw the bodies. In many cases, the records were missing, either accidentally or because they were intentionally destroyed. In more recent times, graves of dead infants have been dug up for DNA testing, but some graves contained no remains, while others contained those of an adult. After Franco died in 1975, Spain transitioned back into a democracy. Both parties of Spain decided to avoid confronting the legacy of Franco directly. They called this the Pact of Forgetting. It was an attempt to move on from the Civil War and subsequent repression and to concentrate on the future of Spain. So basically, we need to put this behind us and focus on our new democracy and moving forward together. No one was prosecuted for human rights violations or other crimes committed during the Francoist period, and responsibility was not placed on any particular social or political group. This was and remains controversial to this day. The democratization and reunification of Spain was successful in the years after the Pact of Forgetting. However, it prevented Spaniards from seeking justice for the crimes that their relatives endured during the Francoist years. This leads us to the Historical Memory Law, which recognizes the victims on both sides of the Spanish Civil War. It gives rights to the victims and their descendants, and it formally condemns the repression of the Franco regime. It prohibits holding political events at Franco's burial place and calls for the removal of objects that exalt the coup, civil war, and Francoist repression from public buildings and spaces. So mostly statues of Franco himself. It also helps restore Spanish nationality to those who left Spain under Franco for political or economic reasons, as well as their descendants. And it offers state help in the tracing, identification, and eventual exhumation of victims whose corpses are still missing, often buried in mass graves. The historical memory law passes on October 31st, 2007, one month after the release of the orphanage. This means that while this movie was in production, the entire country was grappling with these topics. The work of the historical memory law continues to this day, with a new democratic memory bill passing just last year in 2021. The new legislation aims to eliminate loopholes and cover a wider range of victims and crimes related to Francoism, as well as continuing to promote the search and exhumation of victims buried in mass graves. The last public Francoist statue was also removed just last year in 2021. So how does this relate to the orphanage? Um, I think that this movie is not just a horror movie, but it's a reflection of a nation that is reckoning with its traumatic past. So if Laura is around seven years old in the opening flashback scene, and she's 37 when the movie takes place, then it's likely 1977 during the flashbacks, placing us just two years into the Pact of Forgetting. Which means that all of Laura's childhood and formative years would have taken place during the Pact of Forgetting. I think that there are a lot of references to the Pact of Forgetting throughout the movie. Laura moves her family to a house that she doesn't know the full history of because that history has been hidden from her. She doesn't know what happened to her friends there. She only remembers an idealized past. And the door to the basement has literally been papered over. At first, Laura doesn't want to know about the house's history. She refuses to believe that Tomas's friends are real. And Simone, who represents the younger generation, tries to show her this history by showing her Tomas's little house, but she rejects it and she reacts violently. Benina might be a reference to the role the Catholic Church played in the lost children of Francoism. She's first accused of kidnapping Simone, but we later learn that she murdered the other orphans and covered it up by burying them in a mass grave. After Simone's disappearance, Laura's role goes from being along the lines of the Pact of Forgetting and not wanting to know, to being desperate to find out the truth of what's happened, which is more similar to the historical memory law. She exhumes the mass grave that contains her former friends, and she desperately wants to find out what happened to Simone and follows the clues that lead her to knowing Benina is responsible for the murder of her friends. Yeah, I, I think interestingly, you know, you could say, well, that's a reach, <laughs> But the fact is, this movie is Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I just watched 
I think it's called Parallel Mothers by Almodovar. Oh. And this same theme is in that movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened under Franco, digging up bodies, mm-hmm. mass graves. So it's definitely in the Spanish consciousness. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, the house is interesting for a lot of reasons, but um, it was converted into a hospital during the Spanish Civil War. Um, that's also why this is the first film of so many people. Um, in two different interviews that I read with the director, um, it, someone asked him, do you feel like a like part of a new wave of Spanish directors? And he says, in Spain, we're just beginning to have the tools to compete with international movies. I'm not just talking about technical aspects. I went to a film school, something impossible for filmmakers older than me in Spain, where all film schools had vanished. And in another interview, he says, one of the great things at the moment in Spain is that we were the first generation with democracy. Mm -hmm. After what happened in the Franco regime, the government paid a lot of care to our education and culture. And then he talks about the movies that he saw on the one TV station that was on Spanish TV at the time. But that's why it's the first movie of all these people is because film school didn't exist Mm. before the 70s. And he was the first generation who was able to do that. Oh, it's interesting. And because when I was watching it, and speaking of like you, how you are comparing Benina to some of the historical figures, for me, I just consider that like another trope of like, hey, there's this creepy woman who works in an orphanage. Like in movies that have like abandoned kids or orphanages, there's there's usually a creepy intern or an orderly or there's some sort of thing that comes into play. And so for me, I just put her in that position. Um, not so much a hor- historical context, but just like, oh, that was just her role. Of course, she murdered the kids because it's a creepy orphanage. In one of the interviews I read, um, the studio wanted them to kill Benina at the end and they were like "Mm, no that's what everyone would like expect to happen so they killed her in the middle to like sort of prove like anything can happen Mm -hmm. well I also like the fact that Benina came back halfway through because it proved that that she was real like in a way like because the dad didn't see her she the woman saw her or the mom saw her like in the shed in the yard and for me like, it proved that she was real. Like, at that point, like, I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about Benina, but I was just like, oh, she... And I guess in retrospect, right now, it doesn't make any sense because Laura didn't see any of the other ghosts. But for some reason, I when Benina showed up, like, in the middle of the street, and I was like, oh, can the dad see her? Like, I literally was like, can the dad see her? And then when she gets killed, I'm like, yes, she's real and she's <laughs> murdered. Um, was she pushing a baby stroller yep. with yeah. a doll in it, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, it was it the dad that goes under the car to try to see, like, yes. or the mom yeah. was yeah. underneath the car yeah. to try to find the body, right. and she's like, "Simone, Simone." Does she think Simone was like in the baby carriage? Well, if he had, if she, if Benina had kidnapped him, right? It's possible, although he'd be way. It was too very big small. It, like yeah. he wouldn't have been in there. But it's like, <laughs> 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 it's was it the doll? It. Was it the doll version? Like Benina didn't kill yeah. Simon. But Dina doesn't even know Simon's dead. She has nothing to do with Simon. No, she has Tomas's doll. Because, you know, Tomas's right. doll is in the, the carriage. Yeah. Laura mm-hmm. finds the right. dolls that represent each of the orphans. Benina took the Tomas doll with yeah, her. And it's her still her right. son. So she's, yeah. 30 years later, she's drive a push buggy with the, her doll in it, man. It does drive me insane that Laura, like, swings Simone's, like, what she thinks is Simone's body out from underneath the ambulance. Like, if he has any neck injury <laughs> you just killed him exactly like yeah. i yeah. mean she's not the doctor in the family but right um yeah that house um erected in 1899 by s- some random guy but he died <laughs> in the house <laughs> within the first year it was completed that's mm. always a good sign yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> um the writer i think it's sergio sanchez he says that um they found that house it had been abandoned for over 30 years. Um, and what happened was that the woman who owned the house at the time, her child was hit by a car right in front of the main entrance. Oh, my gosh. She associated the house with those memories, so she decided to move out and never come back. And so um, the house was in, like, a super dilapidated state, and the roof was about to collapse, which is why they had to build sound stages for the interior stuff. Wow. And it was converted into a hospital during the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. So a lot of people have died there in real life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Youch. Let's make um, another Poltergeist movie. Did, I, did anybody die during the making of this there? I guess they made it in the sound studio. But, yeah, no, everyone's yeah. still alive, I think. Huh. Or are they? 
<laughs> Are we ready to read it? I would say so. Yeah. Uh, okay, so for the scary scale, I'm going to give it a two out of five. I do not find this movie scary at all, really. Um, and then the overall film rating, I'll give it an eight out of ten. Um, I think the story is really well crafted, but there are just some elements that are kind of uh, generic or like cliche. I'll go next. So on the scarometer, I give it actually three stars, even though I didn't find it so terribly scary. There were a lot of great tense scenes and a lot of just general background creepiness that I really, really liked. I also give it eight out of 10 stars for the movie. I just, I really liked it. I liked the storytelling. I really liked the acting. I also thought it was beautiful, even though I do agree that there were a few plot elements that seemed a little recycled from other things. Still, I really liked the movie. Uh, well, I did not think the movie was very scary. I'll give it a, I'll give it a one and a half out of five. It had like some, some darker elements or more suspense or like I am expecting to be afraid, but I know I'm not going to be afraid kind of thing. But in a good way, it was that part of it didn't feel tropey to me. That's just, I didn't feel like that was the goal. I think, well, they may have, they probably wanted it to be scarier, but for me, I was fine with the way it was for this movie. I didn't think it was going to be scary, but I'll give it a one and a half out of five. There were some some dark moments. Um, and for the film rating, I shouldn't have to watch an hour and a half of a movie before I start liking parts of it, even if I appreciate <laughs> the acting and appreciate the scenes and some of the, the cinematography. like I want to be more invested into like wanting to finish the film or not be distracted. Um, so I'll give it a four out of ten, which is not that great, but I just... I, I went in not thinking I would like this movie, not knowing a lot about it, but just like, I'm just like, I'm not going to. Plus, for me, which I haven't complained about, yes, I'm not a super fan of watching foreign language films. I'm more of a visual person. I want to watch everything that's happening on the screen and versus reading um, subtitles. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not a highbrow. I have watched plenty of films that are foreign languages that I've enjoyed and are really spectacular, great films or TV shows. It's just not my go-to for like, hey, let's watch a casual horror movie, you know, on a Saturday night. Like, I'm not... I just, I have to be really in the mood for it. And I just, this was, you know, prescribed to me. Um, so I just, I just did not have a great time with it. I was just like, went into it not thinking I was going to like it. There were pieces I did like, but I should not have to watch an hour and a half of a movie before I get to like the last 20 minutes with all this stuff that came out that I really enjoyed about the kids games and the Peter Pan and all of that, those themes that I really did like, that did tie the movie together. Anyways, four out of 10 for me. Um, don't want to watch it again. So... Maybe didn't even want to watch it the first time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the as I was as I said earlier, like that's one thing that's cool is with things like this or with the book discussions happening here is like I get to watch things I normally wouldn't would have just set on the shelf or not watched or read. Mm -hmm. So I do appreciate like a different like point of view of things or just like discussing things. Plus, too, it's like Amanda sit in a room and watch this movie, and then there's no purpose or no like after effect. So. It, discussing it like you get to like i just learned so much about spain and its history <laughs> and then plus I, I do like a creepy house i like a haunted house i do like that trope um so yeah going Anyways. off of that <laughs> i don't expect you to feel the same way but i said the same thing after the fog i'm obsessed with the fog yeah. now <laughs> i don't know what happened but awesome. i think about it constantly now which yeah. is so weird because the other episodes we did like I went so in depth that I was just sort of ready to be done with each one afterward, like just sort of box it up and put it on the shelf for later. I'm still thinking about the fog. I'm still looking up lighthouses. I'm still thinking yes. about the ghosts in the fog, like in the fog in the church at the end. So it yep. makes me extremely happy, Allison. You're, you're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. you know, in next episode, I'll start thinking about the orphanage again. So I'll be, <laughs> Allison, I'm, I'm obsessed with orphanages and dead kids. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> oh, um, that's cool. Matt. So, scary meter, uh, not particularly scary, definitely scarier than um, Tale of Two Sisters was for me, though. So I Really? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because there, oh. there were actually things that were set up to be scary. At no point did I feel that in a Tale of Two Sisters. Uh, so I think I gave that like a two or something. So I'll give this one a 2.5 or a three, maybe. Just because there were enough points that were tense um, and 
also like it, it gets a full number bump up just from that that smashed face gory thing that was awesome <laughs> um, the movie itself um i'm gonna say i'll give it a seven and that is generous that's very um, generous because like you were saying amanda i i totally i usually have a test with movies where if it doesn't have me in the first 20 minutes i don't keep watching it and if I hadn't been watching this for a express purpose of recording a podcast. I don't know that I would have continued to watch it. By the time it gets three quarters way through the movie, it totally had me and it really stuck the landing and it did, it bumped up what I would have called like a five out of 10 movie, um, a seven out of 10 movie. (laughs) I also, when I sat down to watch it, assumed I wasn't going to like it because I have an aversion to horror movies from the mid late, 2000s because they're mostly dog shit, I think. That was my prime era. I know. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I was like, burn. <laughs> yeah. But no, and, I can kind of agree with that. And like, I have so, a hard time. And like you, well, so I think that the 70s and 80s is very much the era that that's like what I grew up watching. So when all of the jump scare, um, highly stylized things started coming out basically around the time of The Ring, mm-hmm. um, I think that I think the ring is an is an exception. I actually like that, but then everything that came after that and that was approved by studios was just a series of derivative trash. And it's why I didn't see a movie like Insidious because it. When I look at that poster, I see, oh, good, this is one of those movies, <laughs> you know. And so I assumed that that's what this was, even though this was never on my radar. I just figured, oh, two thousand seven. Guillermo del Toro produced, okay, this might be bad. Mm-hmm. But again, to echo something that you just said, Amanda, this this is something I wouldn't normally watch. And I ended up walking away from it really enjoying it. And I still have been thinking about a couple of particular sequences in the movie. Mm-hmm. Huh. So it, yeah, it, I don't know that I'll necessarily go back to it, but I did really like it. And if somebody's ever looking for a, a you know, ghost movie or a haunted house movie or something like that, I would recommend it to huh. somebody that, if, if that's what they're looking for. It's usually not what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. Are you looking to cry? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the other thing. It's just like, yeah. It, I've it's, got the movie for yeah. you. Yeah. But yeah. it did have the, the gothic and the fantastical yeah. elements to it. And I think that's a certain thing that people can be attracted to. For me, those are the redeeming qualities in this. Definitely. Like it wasn't just a ghost story. Right. Um, it wasn't just a haunted house story or just like, you know, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I can see. And I suspect that if this was remade by an American filmmaker, it would be the worst. Yeah. And it would be jump scares and it would be gore the whole time. And it would be. It, well, like, yeah. The little boy would have come back to life. Yeah. And I don't want right. to see and that. And bitten somebody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, if you like what you heard today and want to let us know, you can email us at whatscaresus at aadl.org. Thanks for joining us. This has been What Scares Us.